Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Every day there are countless books and articles that are published offering the key on how to make your business a success. It's easy to feel overwhelmed trying to keep up and run your business. That's why Deb Creer created the Business Power Hour. Keep up on the latest trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. Let the Business Power Hour do the heavy work for you. Good morning, good morning. I am Deb Creer, and I am passionate about giving professionals the tools that they need to make themselves and their businesses as successful as possible. And I'm always really thrilled when I get to talk to somebody else who is from C-Suite Network because we have such fabulous members. And so please join me in welcoming Sarah Michelle to our program today. Welcome, Sarah. How are you doing? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. I was telling someone that I was so looking forward to this because you are one of the most energetic people I know. And it's been kind of low energy, just everything going on in the world. It's been crazy. And been I was so weird excited. the last couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. I was excited to see your name pop up on my calendar. And I thought, oh, it is impossible to have low energy talking to Deb Greer. This is so true. Excited. This is true. You know, and, and I do this in only one cup of coffee a day. <laughs> and actually i do my one cup of coffee way early in the morning because midnight i'd still be going zzz, 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 you know yeah mm -hmm. my caffeine cutoff gets earlier and earlier the older i get so mm -hmm. it's at about noon now mm -hmm. i imagine another yeah. few years i'll be you know my cutoff will be 8 a.m i know you know and i'm you could give me decaf and i wouldn't know the difference um yeah. you know and and but but yeah so let me tell people a little bit about you because i'm so excited to, to get started and have this conversation so Sarah Michelle is a brand strategist and identity evangelist with over a decade of experience in helping business leaders articulate who they are to the right people at the right time. After a successful career in advertising and global internet internal marketing roles, Sarah founded her own company, HoneyMap, in 2016. She continues in her role as CEO, as well as a C-suite consultant, and she is the host of the Successful-ish podcast. So again, Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited for this conversation. I know. We're going to have so much fun. So one of the things I always like to ask my guests is, how in the heck did you get to where you are today? Because you've had kind of a varied career. So how did you determine that branding, and in particular personal branding, is where your passion lies. You know, what's really interesting about my career path is that for the longest time, it felt so scattered and disconnected. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I laid it all out that I realized mm -hmm. there was sort of this magical thread that went through yeah. all of it and all the mm -hmm. random pieces kind of went together. Mm -hmm. So initially, I think it was just my interest in understanding people. I mm -hmm. was sort of a wallflower kid and I was friends with everyone, but didn't really fit in with anyone. And so I thought advertising was a good way to understand how people think uh -huh. and how mm -hmm. to get people to like you, how mm -hmm. to understand what matters to people. Mm -hmm. So I studied advertising and public relations. Mm -hmm. I got my uh, career start in the agency world. I worked mm -hmm. for a couple different ad agencies, got to wear all the different hats, got to see all of the chaos mm -hmm. and craziness and creativity and burnout and just everything that goes with advertising culture. Mm -hmm. And then I moved from San Diego, California to Boston. Oh my. <laughs> and completely switched gears. Mm -hmm. I, for one, San Diego and Boston are night and day. Mm -hmm. San Diego, we're very chill. We're on a beach right. most mm -hmm. of the time. A um, laid back. Very mm -hmm. Slow, very laid back. Mm -hmm. Boston is not no. Um, no. because <laughs> you have places to be. And mm -hmm. after working in Boston, I started to understand it. Mm -hmm. um, when I first got there, I thought, man, people are so rude. They won't stop and talk. Everyone's in a mm -hmm. hurry. And then I started commuting into Boston and I realized if you miss your train, you're just stuck in the snow. Right. So I understand mm -hmm. why people mm -hmm. are in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So completely switched gears. I worked for State Street Global Advisors, mm -hmm. which is a huge global financial company. Mm -hmm. And so unlike crazy fast-paced advertising, mm -hmm. everything is very slow. Everything mm -hmm. has to go through compliance. Right. Mm -hmm. Every word get... has to be blessed. Mm -hmm. Yes. It took at least two or three days to put any kind of comment, even if it was just a sentence on LinkedIn. Um, so completely different. 
And then I decided to go out on my own. And so for the last few years, I've had my own company. Mm -hmm. I started off in in an agency model. I thought Mm -hmm. I will just take what I've learned and I'll help small businesses with their marketing. And in the midst of building up this cute little hobby business, it was Mm -hmm. never designed to be profitable. It was Mm -hmm. designed just so that I could share some free expertise or really cheap expertise Mm -hmm. with small businesses. Um, I was married at the time we were in the process of adopting and starting a family. And in the final phase of that, my partner realized he was not ready to be a father or husband. Uh And that whole plan just fell apart. Mm -hmm. And I found myself with no money. He drained the account, took everything that we had. And I had this cute little hobby business that was making nothing. I had Mm -hmm. baby clothes in the closet and I just watched my whole plan just go right out the window you you were an example of the word pivot (laughs) yes a massive Mm -hmm. pivot Mm -hmm. um it was a lot to process and at the time that all of that officially unraveled Mm -hmm. it was the holiday season so nobody was hiring with corporate and so Mm -hmm. i had to become a real business really Mm -hmm. quickly so that process really forced me to Mm -hmm. become a real business how do i generate revenue Mm -hmm. how do i generate enough revenue to sustain the business and provide for myself Mm -hmm. and during the process of building up my own business and really being involved in brand strategy and helping other businesses build businesses and branding and marketing, Mm -hmm. I realized there were so many parallels between what I was doing for businesses and what Mm -hmm. I was doing in my own life. Right. And so it was a unique time of really understanding that the more work that I did to make myself a healthier, more whole person, Mm -hmm. the more healthy and whole my business was. Mm -hmm. It really, my business grew with me, which was really cool to see. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, I also saw so many business owners would come to me telling me that their problem was that they needed better social media or that the problem was that they needed a website or the problem was that they needed a new CMO or whatever Mm -hmm. it was. And they would be unhappy with the results and we would Mm -hmm. trace the problem back and it would always go to the top. It would always go to the business owner Mm -hmm. or to the leadership in charge. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself kind of doing marketing and business strategy, but Mm -hmm. also pulling a lot from psychology and Ah. my background as a peer Mm -hmm. counselor. So it was kind of half marketing, half therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in my own unique niche and it really evolved from there. That's what evolved into the podcast. That's what evolved into working with business owners and Mm C-suite leaders directly. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I really realized with the importance of branding and marketing, there is, it's so important to know the intersection between personal and professional. Mm -hmm. And I think for years we've had this barrier where we think that, you know, we have our personal life at home, we have our professional life in Mm -hmm. the office. And never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. Yes. We can't let people know that, Mm -hmm. you know, we're humans at home. We have Mm -hmm. to have this professional front. Mm -hmm. And when COVID happened, um, probably about a year and a half after my life pivoted. I had my own personal crisis. Mm -hmm. I watched the world go through the same kind of process. Definitely the the who am I type of conversations. It was a giant reset. I think when you go through something like that and you're just knocked on your behind, it forces you to realize that maybe the system doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Maybe the conveyor belt that you've been on isn't actually going anywhere. And so I watched a huge shift with business owners, with corporations. And I think that for the first time, especially with people working from home and having those blurred boundaries and with social media being at the height of what it is right now, Mm -hmm. there really is no such thing as personal life, work life or work life balance. It really is just life Mm -hmm. and who we are is very transparent. Mm -hmm. And so um, understanding who we are as a person Mm -hmm. is paramount for who we are as a business. Mm -hmm. And that just translates to everyone who's working with us, all of our customers. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I've been invested Mm -hmm. in for the last few years is working with business owners and business leaders and helping them pinpoint Mm -hmm. that intersection so that they can be healthier leaders and then inspire healthier brands. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and, and we see it all the time where, you might know somebody in their professional and in their personal life, and they're very different. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of times the personal life, you see the more laid back, you see the fun loving, the family, I mean, all of those various things. And they think when they're in the office, they must be this buttoned down person. And 
you know, the problem is they're fighting yeah. what they should, you know, what they want to be. Yeah. It, it's almost like you're fighting against yourself. Mm -hmm. And I see that all the time with businesses that think that they need to create a brand. Right. And so it's interesting. The average lifespan of a CMO is about two years. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's right. all they get because yeah. companies bring in someone and they think, okay, our mm -hmm. problem is that they're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yes. We need better marketing, new marketing. And so you bring in this new CMO, mm -hmm. you give them two years and then it still doesn't fix the problem. So mm -hmm. you kick them out and right. you bring mm -hmm. in a new CMO and mm -hmm. the same with advertising agencies, mm -hmm. people go through different agencies and they're not happy with what they're getting. And a lot of times I've been on both sides of it. I've been in the agency world. I've been in the global internal world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the breakdown really was just in communication mm -hmm. and in the fact that people weren't talking to each other. Right. So you have people on your marketing team who aren't talking to your sales team, mm -hmm. who have no oh, yeah. idea. All those two never talk to each doing. other. <laughs> yeah. And they, they have no idea what's going on, what the leadership direction is. And I think if you have a marketing team that doesn't understand the CEO's vision, if everyone in the company is not running in the same direction and doesn't understand exactly what that direction right. is, mm -hmm. you end up with a bunch of very talented, but frustrated individuals mm -hmm. right. who are running full speed mm -hmm. in different directions. Right. And pretty soon and they're going to run away. Yes. Yeah. They go somewhere else and they, they try to repeat it and kind of live off the hype of a new job or a new role. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting dynamic. And I, I think that it's encouraging that I'm seeing more companies that are starting to have those conversations, starting to have those realizations. Right. You know, and, and I think, you know, obviously COVID was not good, but it was good in a lot of ways too. Um, but I think a lot of times the companies that failed did not have that clear knowledge at the top. Um, you know, and, and so restaurant would be a great idea. You know, they might be, you know, I am the restaurant that serves food from noon until 9 p.m. And we seat 20 people per thing. Yeah. You know, you know that's, it, it, that might be, that might be what they were, but that was a subset. I mean, you know, their, their brand might've been bringing the community together or providing great food or, you know, all of those various things. And yeah, they, they just didn't have a clue. So then when they were forced to make a change, they had absolutely no idea what to do. Yeah. I think the importance of having a strong brand identity, it's pivotal to success mm -hmm. because then no matter what happens, mm -hmm. you can pivot that brand identity right. in different directions. Mm -hmm. And I loved, I, I did a cross country trip last summer and I stopped in Cedar Rapids, Iowa mm -hmm. and Iowa had never been on my list of places. No, I've never no, really thought about Iowa. the Midwest, <laughs> um, you know, what's there besides mm -hmm. corn and cows. Um, but I ended up stopping in Cedar Rapids and I was so encouraged because I saw so many businesses, small business, particularly go under or really struggle during right. COVID. Mm -hmm. They just, they shut their doors because they mm -hmm. didn't know what to do. Right. They didn't know how to adapt. They just mm -hmm. sort of panicked and stopped doing anything. Right. Well, in Cedar Rapids, there was such a commitment to entrepreneurship and to the community. Mm -hmm. They got so creative. So mm -hmm. all of the restaurants, there were a couple um, bloggers and they decided to do takeout from all the different restaurants okay. and write big stories mm -hmm. about all the different foods and encourage mm -hmm. everyone in the town to order out as many meals as they could mm -hmm. and keep the restaurants in business. Mm -hmm. um, the local bookstore realized what better is there to do in quarantine right. besides mm -hmm. read? Right. And yeah. So just because you can't come in and pick out a book doesn't mean you still can't read. Yes. They started a book delivery service. Ah. And this is such a small bookstore. They don't have a website because they don't believe in it. They mm -hmm. don't ever want to be on Good the internet. For them. Yeah. You know, but they would have people call in and say, Hey, I want to read this book or mm -hmm. I want to read that book. And so every week they would mm -hmm. stack up all the books and he would load up his car and he would drive around like the I ice cream kind man. of fling him at people. Right. And, we yeah, were and drop, <laughs> drop books off at all the different doorsteps and it got picked up. Um, I think it was the New York times that picked I them up. It. it got picked up mm -hmm. nationally mm -hmm. and their community had the most profitable, successful year they had had. Wow while everyone else was suffering mm -hmm. just because they were creative right. and they rallied. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something really beautiful mm -hmm. in, in knowing that just because we can't move forward with a plan that mm -hmm. thought would work or right. the plan that is the status quo, mm -hmm. sometimes it's those moments that force you to be the most creative mm -hmm. and have the best successes. Yeah. 
You know, and, and I'm guessing that that bookstore owner, probably his personal brand was, you know, helping the community, serving yeah. the community, doing those things, you know, encouraging reading, obviously. Yes. And Very so, you know, then he, he thought about it. It's like, how can I do that? Um, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, and yeah, Cedar Rapids is not a huge town. So it was not like he was driving for hours and hours. But yeah, I mean, it was it was something that he was able to do pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, it was so encouraging to see just the innovation. And it mm -hmm. was it was interesting to watch different businesses and how they responded. And right. I feel like there were some that couldn't pivot. They couldn't mm -hmm. adapt. Right. And yeah. So no, we're in this box. Doors. We must survive in this yes. box. Mm -hmm. it, it's the ones who were able to be creative that were able to move forward. And I think that I think that's something that's true for business. I think it's true in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. I think the importance of, I mean, the most important thing you can learn as a business leader, as a business owner, it's not the marketing or the C-suite structure or the mm -hmm. business things that are easy enough to Google or figure mm -hmm. out. It's the personal qualities of mm -hmm. resilience, right. adaptability, empathy, mm -hmm. those core qualities. And I think that that was a beautiful thing of being quarantined was that it gave everyone some extra time mm -hmm. to develop those skills right. mm -hmm. because we're, you know, we're so used to just running full speed on the treadmill. We don't have time to stop and think about no. whether or not it yeah, works. Is this what we really want to be doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think so many businesses were in the but this is the way we've always done it mode yes. you know and and they they were in that mode no matter what covid had nothing yeah. to do with it um you know and and but then when they were forced to change that mode they had absolutely no idea what to do because they'd never thought about it you know yeah. and and really you know who thinks hmm, the world's going to shut down <laughs> you know? no yeah. but there are supply chain issues there are you know floods there are you know all sorts of things and so people, you know, had to have thought about some of those and then they were able to say, okay, you know, we can't do that. So let's do this. Yeah, absolutely. I think that those conversations are so important just to, mm -hmm. to be able to pivot, to be able to adapt, to be able to think about different ways to do things. And it, it's surprising how difficult it is. And I think that a lot of that is fear of mm -hmm. being um, taken over by competition. Right. I mm -hmm. think that advertising marketing is a great example of that. People mm -hmm. are terrified to think mm -hmm. outside the box when right. it comes mm -hmm. to marketing, which is crazy because marketing is all about mm -hmm. creativity. Right. And yet you have a world full of creative geniuses mm -hmm. that are terrified to be creative. Mm -hmm. And I saw that working on both sides. I would see clients who would hire the agencies and the agencies knew that the advertising wasn't going to be successful, right. but they were mm -hmm. too afraid to tell yeah, the client. It's what the client told them to do. Yes. So they ran it anyway. And it's like, okay, client, why are you paying this agency big money <laughs> to do right. something? And mm -hmm. then not letting them do it. You could pay an intern to do what you want them to right. do. Mm -hmm. The same with internal companies. I would see them put budgets into things that just weren't fruitful or they right. would have different messages. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important rather than just jumping through best practices to really stop and look at mm -hmm. what your metrics actually are. Right. Mm -hmm. And numbers are great. Um, mm -hmm. I believe in numbers. I believe mm -hmm. in knowing your numbers, but a lot of metrics are intangible. Mm -hmm. And I think those are equally as important right. to pay attention to, because mm -hmm. I think about how many times I've dropped my phone and accidentally clicked an ad Mm -hmm. That's a number for someone, but yeah. that doesn't oh, yeah. mean you're like, I oops, just cost them 50 cents. <laughs> um, I have shared ads mm -hmm. with people before mm -hmm. just to say, wow, look how terrible this mm -hmm. ad is. Right. Or good, but usually or, or it's good. Little. Yes. But <laughs> if I share it and I say, you know, this is a terrible ad for the business, they're going to say, oh, look at this metric. Someone shared this content. That doesn't. <laughs> and part of it really is we spent X million dollars on it. Yeah. Therefore, it must be good. Yeah. And I, I just see that all the time. I've worked with agencies who have referred to their clients as dumb or, oh, well, they're Ooh. dumb. They won't know the difference. We're right. just going to do this because it makes the most money for mm -hmm. us. It's what everybody else is doing. Yes. And mm -hmm. as a business owner, that hurts my soul that someone could right. pay that mm -hmm. kind of money for an agency that just thinks, oh, well, we're, we're just going to do what we want to do to make more mm -hmm. money. They're too dumb to know. Right. So I think that in that regard, it's, there's a lot when it comes to branding and marketing where I feel like we just pass it off to someone else. Mm -hmm. 
let's just give it to the agency. Mm -hmm. Let's give it to the CMO. Right. Because then it's and, not our fault if it doesn't yes. work. Yeah. And delegation is important, but I think as a business leader, you have to know your brand well enough to know whether or not the places and the people that you're investing right. in are translating it correctly, mm -hmm. that they're doing it well. And so I think that that's where a lot of the frustration and the um, misuse of dollars and time is mm -hmm. going is just people don't have that clear understanding. They're just kind of doing the things to do the things right. and it's not actually returning the investment. Right. You know, and as you mentioned, sometimes they're just afraid. I mean, I keep coming back to this, this biz, the bookstore owner, you know, so he's going to deliver books. There's another big company that does that. Yes. <laughs> you know? And, you know, granted the pandemic slowed him down a little bit. You didn't, you didn't necessarily get it, you know, the same day, but for him to think, quite literally, I'm going up against Amazon. Yeah. That takes a lot of, <clears throat> you know? but yeah. what he brought to that was, I'm guessing that personal touch, you know, you'd call him and say, Hey, Bob, what do you think? This is kind of what I like. And he would say, well, here, um, you know, there's, there's a bookstore in Alabama, the, a little, little bookstore that, that we go to, we actually drive to Birmingham, which is three hours away just to go to this bookstore now we make it worth their while um you know and, and because they they do signed first editions okay for the cost of whatever the book would have been anyway so these aren't marked up and they're usually new books but you know we have have made friends with the owner and his name is jake and he is one of the absolute most delightful men in the world but you know twice a year so before birthday and before christmas i will contact him and i say i will say jake I need you to pick out X number of books that Tom will like based on what he has bought. And, you know, now Amazon is going to give you suggested books, but that really doesn't, you know, it's the, their, their algorithm has nothing to do with Jake looking at it and going, okay, well, he mentioned that he really liked this. And then he said this one, not so much. Um, and, you know, and, and so he will, you know, he really does think about it. And he also tells me if it's a book that he didn't like, we'll trade. Um, you know, and, and so just that little bit of personal service. Now, one of the things he did, I mean, we contacted him during the shutdown and we said, Hey, Jake, we'd like to come over. Is there any way you can open up? And he said, for you, we will. And so we spent half a day there. I mean, just, you know, and now, you know, I, I get me a book. I sit in the corner. I read my husband and Jake had a fabulous time chatting, catching up all these various things. So, yeah, I mean, he provides the same service online people do, but it's that extra personal touch that makes him successful. Absolutely. It's the experience. Mm -hmm. I think that people want to be a part of a good story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's so much cooler to have mm -hmm. the local business owner right. take his little Prius to your house mm -hmm. rather than oh, yeah. and, you know. drop something mm -hmm. off. And mm -hmm. I think about how many times that I have driven an hour, two hours, because I really like my hairstylist, even oh, though yeah. I moved. Or, I flew back um, to Colorado twice. <laughs> yeah, I I drove about two hours to keep my dogs at the vet that they right. had been at because I didn't like the local ones. They were fine. They had fine yeah. service. Mm -hmm. But the vet that I had been to, they were so friendly. They really cared. They knew mm -hmm. my pets. Yep. So it was worth it to me to drive further because their brand was genuinely caring. I felt like they they were there because they really cared mm -hmm. about my pet's health right. and about me. Yeah. So I think that there's huge opportunity and it's really not that hard mm -hmm. Um, in such a busy world, if we just take a little bit of extra effort in caring and remembering details about someone. And I think that it is easier to do that when we're not forcing it, when it's not a business tactic, but when, right. when it's just naturally flowing mm -hmm. out of a mission mm -hmm. that we're naturally passionate right. about. Yeah. So I think that that's a huge importance of knowing your brand is knowing what's my motivation. Am I doing this? just to make money. Right. And if that is the motivator, you mm -hmm. got to really love money to have that mm -hmm. fuel you. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that's a bad motivator. No, because we have rent we have to pay and things yes. like that. Mm -hmm. But if you have something that you really care about and it just naturally flows out, you don't have to stress about best practices and about understanding the marketing right. and about figuring everything mm -hmm. out it because it happens. Everything you do is just an extension of who you are. Right. And so it becomes, it makes business so much more effortless 
because all you really have to do is be your best self right? and everything else just mm-hmm. kind of flows. Yeah. You know, on my program numerous times and on yours too, you know, you've probably, one of the things that we talk about is that a leader, so might not be the CEO, might not be the manager, but the leader, the biggest trait they have to have is empathy. Yes. Um, you know, and, and, and I think we're seeing that more and more, um, but, but you're right. It's so easy to do some of those things. You know, that's a great, great example. You know, we have a house full of, of pets and, you know, it, they could make notes in my file so that when I check in, they go, hey, you know, we saw that Diva came in last time. How's she doing? As opposed to next. <laughs> you know? And or worse, they forget. And, you know, and, and I've been known to tell them, you know, I don't ask for special favors, but we spend several thousand dollars a year here. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, but yeah, I mean, you know, you can have it in your CRM where, you know, and, and I mean, Dale Carnegie taught that years ago, you know, the, the thing about sending birthday cards, remembering anniversaries, those little touches are what people remember. And, yeah. you know, the, the thing about sending cards, I mean, I have several here on my desk that are, um, they're just little thank you notes that people sent to me that, you know, it took them, you know, by the time they got them and did the envelope and all of that stuff, five minutes at the very most, but it's sitting here on my desk and I will remember them. Yeah. Um, you know, or even if you just send somebody a quick email message, Hey, you know, it was great meeting you today. Thank you so much. Um, all of these various things. It's, it just takes that little extra piece for somebody to go, okay, the next time I have to choose, I'm going to remember this. Yeah, it, it really is. I think that a lot of times we think that we need to differentiate by service or by price, and you can only do so much right. differentiation with that. Mm-hmm. It's it's who you are mm-hmm. in charge of the business. Right. That's what fuels the culture. Mm-hmm. That's what fuels the customer mm-hmm. experience. And I think a great example of that, I moved recently and I needed to find a new dojo. I train in Krav Maga Mm -hmm. and I was really heartbroken to leave my last. Right. I mean, that is clearly something very personal, you know, very personal bond that you develop. Mm -hmm. Yes. They were such good friends. They'll be lifelong friends. Mm -hmm. And I moved to a place that didn't really have anything where I am. And so I was driving between 30 and 45 minutes to anywhere that was in surrounding Mm -hmm. towns. Mm -hmm. I tried five different places. Mm -hmm. Each of them was about a 30 minute drive. Mm -hmm. They were all the same price. They were all the same Mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. There's zero differentiation Mm -hmm. in terms of service, in terms of price, Mm -hmm. in terms of teaching. If you put them in the little chart, they were going to be the same. They're Mm -hmm. identical, but drastically different experiences. Ah. Mm -hmm. I would walk into one and it was just very cushy. We just very gingerly kind of pushed people and you know, it was, everyone was very um, gentle. It was very educational. I walked into one and it was a bunch of really scary dudes with neck tattoos. And I almost, <laughs> yeah, they, they were so into scared. it, right? You're thinking they're going to break me. <laughs> yes. They were, they were aggressive. And I thought, you know, some of y'all maybe need to talk to a therapist before yeah. you come back. To or maybe they get it all out there. Who knows? Yes. But, yeah, it was scary um, for you. Mm-hmm. It was just fascinating to me to see five different places offering the exact same thing right. with drastically different mm-hmm. experiences. And what led me to love one or hate one had mm-hmm. nothing to do with the service that I already knew I wanted, mm-hmm. had nothing to do with the budget or price point that I already knew that right. I was with. Mm-hmm. in it had to do with do i like the people running this place mm-hmm. do yep. i like them as people do we connect mm-hmm. do i feel like i was seen do i feel like i was heard and do i like the people that i would be training with mm-hmm. and i think that's an important right. part oh of yeah because again well. it's very personal mm-hmm. yeah you're you know you're right up against someone mm-hmm. you really yeah. gotta trust them you really gotta know yeah, them and, and they I, could conceivably hurt you <laughs> yes and I think that's a huge part of branding, of paying attention to, are you bringing in the right customers? Mm-hmm. Marketing is not necessarily always about getting more business. Right. It's about getting the right business. Mm-hmm. I think anyone who has led a business for any amount of time can vouch that mm-hmm. a bad customer is not worth it. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, they are hugely detrimental. And so I, that's a huge part of marketing and branding is making sure that it's not always about growing, about being bigger, about getting more people. Mm-hmm. 
it's about getting the right people mm-hmm. and streamlining and being more efficient mm-hmm. so that you actually enjoy mm-hmm. working in the business mm-hmm. that you created. Right. You know, and that's where people who are only getting clients or customers based on money, mm-hmm. where they lose out, um, because you're not going to really develop loyalty there, you know, because right. if people are only buying you based on price, the next time they're going to look for somebody cheaper. Yes. And yeah. I think that retention is hugely underestimated. I think that very few companies have a retention strategy or right. pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. And gyms particularly are known for that. Gyms have a huge attrition budget. They're right. constantly Yeah, there's I mean, there's in. just the churn. I mean, we know that. You know, they the you know, hey, yeah. you know, join for 10 cents. And then yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're terrible at differentiating because I've been at gyms that are, you know, 10 bucks a month, and I've been at gyms that are 200 a month. Mm-hmm. And they compete with each other, right. which to me is crazy because the right. person mm-hmm. who goes to a planet fitness is mm-hmm. not the person who goes to an orange mm-hmm. theory. Right. Mm-hmm. It's a different um, psychographic yeah. or a different yeah. psychology. The parent, yeah. The, the planet fitness, they just want to go around this, the, yeah. the cycle of machines and be done. Yeah. And I think more when you want that personal care. Yes. And there was so much money invested in let's get more people, more people, more people, right. but they were also losing Mm-hmm. customers right, because they paid no attention to their existing customers. Yes. And then what happens is if you have a bunch of customers that are not the right fit, and let's say you have the wrong fit customer who got talked into paying 200 a month and you're celebrating that sale, woo-hoo, 200 mm-hmm. a month. But then their friends say, Hey, I heard you joined this gym for yeah, 200. I went here like for it? 50. Yep. And then they say, you know, I don't think it was worth it. It wasn't a really great experience. Well, now you've just lost Mm -hmm. two customers. It's exponential, Mm -hmm. not to mention the cost that goes into training new employees. If you hire people without making sure that they're really invested in your brand. Yeah, Yeah, because they're going to jump ship too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a huge problem with bigger companies that have minimum wage Mm -hmm. help. If you have sales associates who would not on their own volition purchase your product or Mm -hmm. tell people to purchase your product. Right. You've now created negative brand ambassadors. Yeah, because you're, every person who works for you should be marketing your company all the time. You know, it should yes. be, oh my gosh, Sarah, you would not believe the place I'm working. You need to come check it out. As opposed to, hey, I got a new job. Yeah, <laughs> and it happens all the time with disgruntled front desk or disgruntled salespeople. And they'll tell people behind the scenes stories, whether it's been, you know, big airlines that have had these types of incidents, mm-hmm. big gyms have had these types mm-hmm. of incidents. So now all of a sudden you're paying people to discourage mm-hmm. people from being right. your customers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and it's hard now because there are, you know, there's so many people that are looking for that right thing, um, yeah. you know, and, and, and what it means is you just have to spend more time at it, but it comes back to what we've been saying. You have to know what your brand is, you know, to, on the gyms. Are you the type of gym that really does just churn people through quickly? And that's fine. I mean, there's, that's obviously works for them. Or are you the type of gym who assigns a personal, uh, uh consultant to each person really is going to work with them on what their pain areas are all of those various things because you know if if you try if you're trying to hire and you don't know that many people won't even work for you they're like (laughs) yeah it it's a huge issue i know when i first started in the agency world it was ironic because we worked a lot with mental health we had Mm. a lot of mental health campaigns and so we were very um big on stigma reduction and Mm -hmm. things like anxiety depression suicide prevention and ironically, I think everyone in our agency was on some kind of oh, no. or anti-anxiety. <laughs> it was a super a stressful, help. Mm-hmm. yes, super mm-hmm. stressful, toxic mm-hmm. environment. And there was this disconnect of trying to position ourselves as an agency that was, you know what, where we don't have any stigma against anxiety. It's all about being calm and being right. creative. Mm-hmm. But what was actually happening was that nobody was calm. Nobody was creative. Right. Everybody was stressed. Everybody uh, yeah, was scared. Agencies, there's a lot of pressure in agencies. I've been with agencies too. Yes. And oy. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that what happens is that a lot of businesses have this disconnect between their implicit messaging and their explicit messaging. Right. And I always joke about the girl who says, I hate drama. 
nine times out of 10, that's the most dramatic dramatic person that you know in your life. Mm -hmm. And so it creates an unsafe relationship Mm -hmm. because they're telling you something, but they're showing you something different. Mm -hmm. So that's a person that, you know, you don't necessarily want to be friends with. You kind of have your guard up around them. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing happens with customers and their businesses. Mm -hmm. If businesses are explicitly telling people we have the best customer service, but Mm -hmm. then I'm stuck in a call queue for five Mm -hmm. hours. Yeah. I'm like, no, Mm -hmm. no, you don't have good customer Mm -hmm. service. And what I'm feeling is always going to be stronger than what Mm -hmm. I'm hearing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that matching that implicit and explicit Mm -hmm. is especially important. And especially today, we have so much access to Google and social Mm -hmm. media. Oh yeah. We can change just like that. Yes. The consumer is so much more educated than Mm -hmm. we used to be. I think that back in the day, we kind of just had to believe Mm -hmm. what companies told us. Mm -hmm. And today consumers are extremely educated. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, if I go to a doctor, Mm -hmm. I could have a whole printout of. (laughs) of Oh yeah. You've gone to Dr. Google first. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've gone to WebMD and I've basically diagnosed myself and I'm Mm -hmm. just looking for confirmation and Uh referrals. And so I think that it's important to keep that in mind that our consumer, mm-hmm. our consumer is smart and they do have a BS meter, right? Oh and yeah. They mm-hmm. are very good at being able to feel when someone is saying something that mm-hmm. doesn't actually align. Right. And so having that alignment in our mm-hmm. brand, having a, a relaxed team that works for us, that is also in alignment, having relaxed customers. Mm-hmm that's going to accelerate mm-hmm. sales. And one of the biggest detriment to sales or the hindrances to mm-hmm. revenue is when we have that disconnect right. or that unsafe mm-hmm. relationship. Right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. My friend, Brian Basilico, who's been on this program several times, recently moved from Chicago to North Carolina. And basically what they did was they sold every stick of furniture that they had because they figured it out. And the costs to move things were more than if they started new. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, one of the first things they had to do, they didn't have a bed. Um, you know, and so he went to various places and, you know, the, the, the one place, well, Hey, we've got the sale, you know, we, and now he is a marketing person. So, you know, he's going to, his, his BS, you know, meter is pretty high. And, you know, and so they're saying, well, you know, you could do this and this and this, and, and it's on sale. And, you know, and, and then there were, you know, one other, he went to another place where they didn't even acknowledge him when he came in the door you know, all these various things. And then there was the place that's, that said, and you know, it, it's the, the original mattress factory, which is big down here in the South. They actually are making the mattresses there. And so they took him in the back and said, here's how we're going to make your mattress, which he just thought was the coolest thing in the world. Right. Yeah. Um, but their price on January 1st is the same as it is on President's Day, because those are big, big mattress, you know, all of those things, you know, and and I think that's the thing that people don't get about price is, you know, if anytime I see an ad that says for one week only get 20%. No, I want that 20% off all the time, you know, and, 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 and they're actually showing what the true value is when they're now granted, there are sales to get rid of items and and things like that. But if it's just the standard couple times a year, I'm going to knock my price way down. And I tell people the same thing with if you're a small business person and you're giving discounts. Um, You know, I always have people who say, what's the friends and family discount? And I tell them, I charge you more because you're probably going to be a pain. (laughs) You know, but the problem is if, if, you know, if you're coming to me as a new client and I tell you, okay, it's a hundred bucks an hour. But you talk to somebody else who paid 75 an hour, you're like, wait a minute, I want the $75 an hour rate, right? You know, and, and so that's what people don't quite understand with pricing is, like you said, we're not stupid people. You know, yeah. we can shop around and figure it out. Yeah. And what's interesting, there's so much psychology when it comes to sales mm-hmm. with little things like... um leaning into FOMO Mm -hmm. and, you know, limited time, you got to do it today. You're going to miss your opportunity. Mm -hmm. Or I watch a lot uh, of late night TV and I'm like, no, (laughs) ending ending numbers in sevens Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, people Mm -hmm. will purchase something for 97, but not for 90 or not for a hundred. Um, so there's a lot of psychology. And when I first started on my own in business, I did a lot of sales trainings. Mm -hmm. I tried to learn from other coaches, consultants, Mm -hmm. and, One thing that I noticed was that, yeah, you can use this psychology and it will work, but it will bring you dumb clients. Right. 
-hmm. it will bring you a dumb audience. And what I mean by that is that they'll buy into the sale because Mm -hmm. they're thinking, you know, oh, it's a limited time or, oh, and then they go to the next person when they need it again. Yes. Mm -hmm. They don't become long-term sales. Mm -hmm. They don't become the good customer that Mm -hmm. understands the value of what they're getting. Mm -hmm. So they're not becoming an evangelist Mm -hmm. for your brand. Mm -hmm. The person who wants what you have for the cheapest and tries to barter back and forth, they mm-hmm. always end up being the biggest pain in the butt. Right. They oh yeah. Like I said, the friends and family, the I charge budget. more. <laughs> They're always the worst. And when you don't do that, when you don't do the, you know, I have three packages and you know, you're trying to get them to Goldilocks mm-hmm. and pick the middle. If you're just straight with people, mm-hmm. this is the value that I know yeah. that I can bring mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. Do you yes or no? Right. You end up with smarter clientele. Mm-hmm. And I think that there are more and more people, particularly in the business leadership world, that are getting smarter because mm-hmm. they're having access to all this. They're understanding, like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, there, these are just strategies that people are using to try to entice me. Mm-hmm. What value is this actually bringing? And right. I think that with COVID, we all had to be a lot smarter about mm-hmm. what we were doing because right. we really mm-hmm. can't afford to leak resources. Mm-hmm. We live in a world that is post COVID there's inflation, mm-hmm. there's recession. It's, it's hard on a lot mm-hmm. of people. It's very important to not leak resources. Whereas before right. things could be leaking and mm-hmm. you know, it's fine as long as we're generally mm-hmm. in the black and mm-hmm. I think that as consumers are getting smarter and as businesses are learning, it's more and more important to stop doing as much of the psychology and the sales Mm -hmm. tricks and really just start having honest conversations Mm -hmm. about this is the value that Mm -hmm. we bring to you. It's going to cost you a hundred dollars. Yep. You know, and, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and I mean, we're not saying you don't discount because there are times. Yeah. Like I said, if you've got extra inventory, all of those various things. Um, you know, we're seeing big discounts now because, you know, the supply chain got disrupted right. and then whoop, everything came loose, right? So, um, you know, they, it, it sell it at any price just to get it off their floors type of things. And, and I'm fine with giving a discount, say, to other Chamber of Commerce members, things right. like that. But we also have to be prepared for somebody to say, hey, I know you knocked 10% off for her. Are you going to knock it off for me? And the second you say, well, no, because you're not a Chamber member, they're gone. Doesn't matter what the value is. Doesn't matter what you're providing. You just annoyed them. Yeah, it, it's an interesting balance. And I think that I think a lot of it has to do with knowing your collaborative partners, mm-hmm. knowing who's bringing value to what right. places. And I've had that conversation with a lot of different business owners, because what I do is brand mapping. And so when I work with clients and I get an idea of where they're at in their business, where they want to go, it really doesn't matter if it's a solopreneur who's just kind of running her own legal practice Mm -hmm. from her home office, Mm -hmm. or if it's a fortune 500, the process of branding and marketing and Mm -hmm. strategy is the same. Mm -hmm. The difference is how much they're investing in and how much they are going to be expecting in the return. Right. And so it would not make sense to charge thousands and thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. for a small business Mm -hmm. entrepreneur who's not going to be making that Mm -hmm. much in their Mm -hmm. first year. Likewise, it doesn't make sense to charge someone in a Fortune 500 Mm -hmm a few hundred bucks Mm -hmm. when it's going to be bringing them so much more. And so that really changed my understanding when it came to learning how to set a price. It's not about what's the cost or what's the price. It's about how much value am I bringing you and how can I tailor this service so Mm -hmm. that it's genuinely going to serve Mm -hmm. you right? and it's going to align with your goals and bring in enough Mm -hmm. for you to be able to invest again. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of times discounting or discounting too much is actually doing a disservice Mm -hmm. to your customer because Mm -hmm. they won't perceive the value. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like selling someone on a road trip who needs to go across the country, Mm -hmm. but only giving them enough gas to get to Kansas. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're like, "Uh yeah, it's really important to know Mm -hmm. how far are you driving? How far are you going? How can we cater a strategy Mm -hmm. so that you know exactly what you need Mm -hmm. to invest practically mm-hmm. and you know what those goals are of what right. you need to return. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and you can have different levels. Um, yeah. I'm in the process right now of creating a new product line and, you know, and, and there will be the kit 
you know, that has this, 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 and this in it. That's, you know, there's no, it, like they say in restaurants, no substitutions. Um, but then there are add on things. So, you know, somebody might want to have this, they might want to have that. So then they can personalize it, they can do those things. So, you know, and, and we can do the same in our businesses. I tell people, you know, especially when I was starting out in business, you know, I, I, and really designing a lot of websites. That we, That's what we did a lot of. And so, you know, I would give a proposal and they would say, oh, that's, you know, that that's $2,000 more than what I wanted to pay. And, and so I learned very quickly to go back to them and say, what are we taking out? Yeah. And, you know, they almost always found that extra $2,000. Or we did, you know, adjust it down. And that was fine because sometimes your budget is your budget is your budget, yeah. you know, and, and, but yeah, they, I would, I would not say, okay, I'll knock it down $2,000 because I really, really, really want your business. Because again, the next time they either came to me or told someone else, they're going to say, oh, she gave me a discount of $2,000 or, you know, $2. I mean, whatever it is, um, your pricing is very tricky. It is. I think it's so much about being on the same page, I think, mm -hmm. of defining value. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I talked to someone who had worked for the Great Antiques Roadshow a while ah, back. Mm -hmm. And I was really curious to understand how they determined value in something. Mm -hmm. How is it that a piece of garbage right. in someone's garage? Yeah. And they, they say, well, this is worth $20,000. And the people are like, I just about threw it away. <laughs> yeah. Who, who decides that? Mm -hmm. Who decides that? Yeah. You know, and I think about, um, I have a lot of friends who are nerds and they mm -hmm. will have things like anime or collectibles right. or mm -hmm. dolls or, you know, I, yeah. I and you're like, dolls. you spent how much money on that? <laughs> yeah. I don't get it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't spend any money right. on it, mm -hmm. but it's important to them right. or, mm -hmm. you know, with the world of sports, I really don't care about football. Mm -hmm. But if the NFL determined their value metric off mm -hmm. of people like me, right, then said, nobody's salary is going to be very much. Yes, I'm not going to pay for football. They would miss out on a ton of revenue because there are people who will pay right. millions or billions mm -hmm. because they love it. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to really thinking about how you're going to do your pricing structure, how to do your value, I think it's really important to know exactly who you're talking to. Right. Mm -hmm. because, and, and I'm going to emphasize that word again. Exactly. Yes. It needs mm -hmm. to be specific because I thought when I started that I was specifically niched by small business owners. Mm -hmm. That was too broad mm -hmm. right. because I would have small business owners who, when I first started, I think I was charging, I think I brought it down as low as 500 and mm -hmm. I would have small business owners. They were getting an entire business strategy, a wow. full business plan. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, I don't know, 500's a lot. I, mm -hmm. I just don't know. But those are also the small business owners that are still exactly where they were mm -hmm. right. six years ago. And for those people, you have some free products. Yes, because that's where they're at. Mm -hmm. There are other times where I know people who have lost business because they have not right. marked themselves up enough. Oh, yeah. And so mm -hmm. you think, oh, well, they seem kind of cheap. Mm -hmm. They must not be credible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's very important to know exactly what value you bring mm -hmm. to someone, who right. you're talking to, who's going to perceive this as mm -hmm. valuable and why. Right. And I think that that's where a lot of small business owners particularly get in trouble is that they just want to jump into making revenue and they don't spend enough time gathering data and asking those questions. Right. And I think that- And if you ask them who their, their client, anybody, anybody, everybody. Yeah. No. Anybody, everybody, <laughs> everybody can use this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if everybody can use it. Mm -hmm. If you talk to everybody, you talk to nobody. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for a lot of people, niching makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I know right, that because they think of, they're leaving money on the table. Yes. And I think I was sort of in that boat where I thought, well, I'm not going to leave money on the table. I want to be able to work with anyone. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I, when you're starting out, let's be honest, you have to do that. Yes. But mm -hmm. I think it's very important to have a plan to get out of that mm -hmm. and to be able to really think about who you're talking to. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, for me, I didn't want to be the marketer for coffee shops or mm -hmm. the marketer for, you know, right. a specific mm -hmm. niche industry. So I think for anyone who is resisting niche because of that, because mm -hmm. they don't want to be bored, 
there's two ways to think about it. It's not always the demographics of having right. to go by industry or mm-hmm. by gender or by, you know, the t- mm-hmm. tangible pieces. Mm-hmm. You can also niche by psychographics. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that often is the more important part mm-hmm. of knowing exactly the psychology of how mm-hmm. your client sees your service. Mm-hmm. What's their worldview? What makes them tick? What is important to them? What is their actual pain point? And a lot of times people don't necessarily know. They know that they have a pain point, but they don't have the words to perfectly articulate it. And so I think that as a business owner, the more you can learn to sort of hear what's not being said and read between the lines and really pay attention to where people are struggling, to what people are complaining about, that's hugely insightful and helpful data to being able to curate your services better. Because a lot of times you may have a perfect solution for someone, you're just not using a vocabulary that they understand. And as soon as you change that language, you realize, oh, wow, you know, we are connected. They just didn't understand that I have what they're looking for. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, when I started out in the agency world, I worked for this gentleman who, you know, and this was, oh gosh, this was a long time ago when we were talking pricing, he never published pricing. I mean, that was, you know, you, you never, and, and he always said, charge what the market will bear. Now he had no niche. I mean, it was, it really was whoever wants to come to us, you know, can come to us. But his point with charge what the market will bear was, you know, if it's somebody like say a physician or a lawyer, they're going to expect that you're going to charge them say 250 an hour because they charge 250 an hour. And so they don't see the value in it if it's less than that. If you're working for a nonprofit, 250 an hour is not going to work. Now you can tell them that's what it is, but we discount it down this much or you know, we do pro bono or whatever. But, but yeah, I always like that charge what the market will bear, but that really comes back to exactly what you were saying. You have to know who your market is before you can charge what, what they will pay. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. that was, that was a big learning curve for me was mm-hmm. to try to figure out, you know, who exactly am I talking mm-hmm. to? Because there are so many, we live in one of the most in the U.S., it's one of the most entrepreneurial countries. Mm-hmm, right. Entrepreneurship, and, and in the last two years, holy schmoly, it, yeah, mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> it's growing. You know, we had the Great Resignation. Mm-hmm. It's catching on globally. There's people mm-hmm. around the globe who are starting their own businesses and right. their own brands. Social media has produced influencers. Mm-hmm. There are people making full incomes off mm-hmm. of TikTok and Instagram. Right. It's, it's accessible for everyone. And so I think that it's changed the world so much in that now it's almost like every single one of us has our own personal public platform. Mm -hmm, We all have a brand. It's just Mm -hmm. a matter of whether we're defining it or we're letting someone else define it. And we want to be the ones defining it. I mean, that is what is absolutely critical is it's our brand, whether it's your, your personal brand or your business we need to be the ones defining it. Absolutely. So important to get in front of your narrative and to realize that brands are not just for companies like Coke or Pepsi. Mm -hmm. Every person, every business has a brand. And if you aren't defining it, your audience will. Right. And And they very well might define it incorrectly. Yes. It might not be what you want it to be. And so I think that it is so important to define the brand, get in front of that narrative, Mm -hmm. and then make sure as the leader of your business, that everything that you're doing is honest to that brand that you've now articulated to people. Mm -hmm. So everything, whether it's hiring someone, whether it's Mm -hmm. having new customers, whether it's advertising, whether it's whatever you're doing, Mm -hmm. it's so important to ask the question, does this reflect Mm -hmm. my brand values? Does this reflect the Mm -hmm. brand personality? Does this fit into the story? Mm -hmm. Is this the right positioning? Brand really needs to be a compass that Mm -hmm. guides everything that we present. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you will be eliminating people, Um, you know, and and that's okay because you probably wouldn't have liked working with them anyway. Um, You know, I remember years ago, I was working with this young woman on her LinkedIn profile and, you know, her, in her picture, her, her, you know, which I wasn't real wild about just because it looked too casual, but that was all right. Her shirt said proud Muslim. And I, you know, said, Mm -hmm. you know, there are going to be people who don't want to work with you because of that. And she smiled at me, this child of in her early twenties and said, I don't want to work with them. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, she knew exactly who she wanted to work for and, and, or with and who she didn't. There was, there was a line. I mean, she was not yeah. going to cross it. And, you know, and, and we see that with businesses that take stands on say political contributions or spokespeople or all of those things. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I noticed that on, on your LinkedIn, you were, you were, you're writing a blog post about the Kardashians. Um, and I am not a Kardashian fan. I've never watched it. And, but the, the commercial that gets me right now is the migraine commercial where they have one of them. Yeah. And I'm thinking, really, is she really appealing to who they are trying to reach out to? And my guess is probably not, but she's the big name. And, you know, it comes back to what we were saying before. Somebody convinced them this is what you need to do. Yes. I think it's so important to know your polarizing qualities. Mm -hmm. And I always ask all of my clients when we go through their whole identity, mm -hmm. um, identity research, I will ask them what celebrities they would want to represent their brand and what celebrities they would never, ever allow right. to represent mm -hmm. their brand. Because sometimes that's an easier way to look at polarizing mm -hmm. qualities right. to see it in other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Kardashians are always on that oh, list. Yeah, on one it, side or the other. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter who I ask. Mm -hmm. The Kardashians have come up, I want to say, if not every time, all but maybe one time mm -hmm. of hundreds of clients I have right. worked with, mm -hmm. they are always on the list. Mm -hmm. So whether you love them, whether you hate them, you cannot deny right. that they are and, queens of branding. Yeah. And, and so you look at that and it's like, okay, are you appealing to a younger demographic yep. who might like luxury items? You know, and then that's where you can dig into it because if that's their product, then yes, if it's migraine medicine, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. Oh my gosh, Sarah, we are almost at the top of the hour. And, you know, this has been so much fun. I have to have you on again because we didn't talk a lot about personal branding. And I want to do that um, because you are, that is, is truly what your expertise is in. So we'll have you on again. But until then, tell people how they find you and what services you provide. Yeah, absolutely. So the best way to find me is at justsarahmichelle.com. That links through to all of my professional services as well as to the Successful-ish podcast. And really the primary clientele that I work with is anyone who is in business ownership or business leadership and is looking to take a pulse check on whether who they think they are matches who their audience thinks they are. And so everything from figuring out, lining, aligning up the mission and the vision, the brand identity, the marketing strategy, and then translating that through messaging, that's really my playground. And so right. I love to work with mission-minded business leaders who mm -hmm. really want to get that alignment in their mm -hmm. brand and messaging. Right. You know, and, and there's a contact form on there. You're also very big on LinkedIn. So, yeah. um, you know, that's great. And, and what we didn't talk about is your website and your name really is just Sarah Michelle. Michelle is your last name. And, and I want to leave people with that teaser so that, you know, next time they're going to tune in and go, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. So cool, cool. Well, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave everyone with? I just thank you so much for having me on the show. I would encourage anyone who's listening, um, don't stress about your brand. You probably know it better than you think you do. Mm -hmm. Take some time doing something that energizes you. Go on a you date, drink some wine, take a hike, uh, go get a massage, whatever it is that reinvigorates you. Mm -hmm you probably know exactly who you are and what to do. It's just a matter of slowing down enough to listen to it. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that. Well, I am Deb Creer. I've been having a great conversation with Sarah Michelle. I can't wait to do it again. Until next time, everyone have a great day. Tune in for our next program for even more trends, best practices, and techniques for how to make your business a success. The Business Power Hour, hosted by Deb Creer, is proud to be part of the C-Suite Network.